A very warm welcome to Virtual Church from Alice and myself. Uh, happy birthday in the sense that last Sunday was Pentecost, which is widely celebrated as the birthday of the Church because it was the coming of the Holy Spirit to live in the hearts of Jesus' followers that was literally the birth of the Church. So Sunday was Pentecost, as you can see over my shoulder there, uh, just behind Alice, there's my red scarf that I wear for days like Pentecost uh, with the flames and the dove uh, and so on of, of the coming of the Spirit. Well, we're continuing our series with the book of James, and we've reached this passage about halfway through chapter 1. And James says this, starting at verse 13, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by their own evil desire they're dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. What's going on here? As James discusses temptation, I wonder what was going through his mind. Maybe steeped in the Hebrew scriptures as he was, his thoughts were going back to Eve in the garden, being tempted by the enemy. And the enemy says, is it really true that God has forbidden you? Did God really say, in other words, uh, you may not eat of any fruit in the garden. And Eve explains, actually, it's, it's all of them. He said that one, we might not even supposed to touch it, making God out to be a little bit more tyrannical. All they've been told was they mustn't eat it. Uh, and then Eve is persuaded that the tree is good for food and, and desirable to make her wise. Uh, God knows you will become like him if you take this fruit. Maybe God even wants you to take it. He can't tell you to take it because he wants you to make a free choice for good or wrong. It's only if you step out of his will that you'll be able to discover what his will really is. That's why it's the knowledge of good and evil. Maybe a long story like that went on. I don't know if you've ever read uh, C.S. Lewis, the author of the, uh, author of the Narnia stories. He also wrote a science fiction trilogy. One of them is set on the planet Venus where the eve of that planet is tempted at great length over a very long period of time by the enemy who tries to uh, present to her that the uh, thing that she's been forbidden to do is not, not a fruit in this case. Uh, God actually wants her to do it and, uh, because God has a secret reason for wanting her to step out of his will. And it goes on and on and on. We don't know how long this very brief narrative in uh, Genesis was supposed to go on for. The Bible's so succinct, isn't it? So often it boils everything down to one or two short but very, very pithy phrases. So this is what James is describing here. God doesn't tempt anyone, but each one is tempted by when their own evil, evil desire they're dragged away and enticed. And it's that process of enticement, isn't it? That somehow the thought of this thing becomes a bit of an obsession. Shall I, shan't I? It becomes almost a major problem to solve uh, in your life. And you start telling yourself little stories about why that might be God's will, or why it might be a good thing to do or even why it doesn't matter particularly, uh, even if it matters for other people, if you break this commandment. And of course, part of the story may well be 
but actually God wants me to be like this. Did you notice that verse? When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. And um, I wonder what David thought when he was gazing at Bathsheba bathing in the, in the cool of the evening on the rooftop opposite. And whether he stayed looking her, at her a little bit longer than he needed to. Whether he thought, oh, the fact that I feel like this and I'm God's chosen must mean that God wants me to commit adultery with this person and get rid of her awkward husband. We so often do that, don't we, when we really want something. Well, we make out God to be a tyrant if he doesn't want us to have that thing. Um, we immediately start putting God in the wrong and accusing God. It's all part of the narrative. But we also simultaneously may be saying, actually, God wants me to do this thing. And so in my pastor experience, I found that marriages have broken up because one of the um, spouses uh, has felt so strongly that they want to be with someone outside their marriage that they've said, well, these feelings must come from God. It must be because God wants me to. We're enticed. Each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he's dragged away and enticed. And maybe there are all kinds of reasons that we make up for ourselves why we should crush a business rival, why we should make sure other people know about how bad some person is our view, otherwise they'll be able to get away with it, won't they? We can always find a good reason, can't we, for doing things uh, that hurt others, that, that actually lead us into disobedience of what God is plainly told, has plainly told us. So it's interesting that James then presents temptation not so much as overwhelming urges in our body, but as that next stage uh, when we're thinking about what to do about it. In other words, in our mind, we start to cherish those little uh, thoughts about doing something that we actually know uh, isn't right to do. And as we think about them more and more, it's our attitudes that start to change, putting ourselves in the right and God in the wrong so we can take what we want. And uh, those who uh, claim to be godly have to be particularly careful about this. You remember in the story of the Good Samaritan, the, who walked by on the other side? The priest and the Levite. Well, they were going up to Jerusalem. They had important duties to attend to. They had to go to the temple. They were doing the Lord's work. So they're just too busy to stop and help this person at the side of the road. And although Jesus doesn't speak any words of, that con of condemnation of them in the, in the immediate context of that parable, surely it's there when he tells another story and says that when the Son of Man comes, he will say, you saw me hungry, you never fed me, you saw me uh, homeless, you never welcomed me in, and, and all those other things. The great sin there was what they didn't do, and we've always got a reason not to do that thing, because that person's so awkward, because people misunderstand what it's really uh, uh, intended to be about. Uh, because, because, because. It's that mental level, actually, where temptation uh, turns or begins to turn into sin. And uh, so that's the stage. It's not, not the overwhelming urges that we have. Jesus was tempted. It says that uh, in black and white in the scripture. Nothing... Uh, evil about us if we're tempted. Jesus went through what we, we go through. He was tempted in every way just as we are, says the scripture, yet without sin. He managed to say no. He managed to ward off the evil desire and remain pure in his mind. 
So, as an old story has it, you can't stop the birds flying over your head, but you can stop them building a nest in your hair. And that process about our attitude, our mind, what we're giving our attention, our thought to, that's the bird building a nest in our hair. So, don't be deceived, uh, dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Uh, what, of course, James is, here, is doing here now is pointing to the holiness of God. Just as he said, God himself isn't tempted and doesn't tempt any, anyone. Why should he when we're perfectly capable of tempting ourselves, uh, for goodness sake? So, uh, the good and perfect gifts, when we're tempted and we cherish that thought and let it build up and up in our minds until we act on it, we're actually saying, God hasn't made, given me good and perfect gifts. These are the gifts that I want, not the gifts that God uh, wants me to have. Those good, perfect and delightful things uh, that do not change. And so he counsels us uh, to start again anew in verse 18. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth. We don't have to succumb to the iron law of sin and death because God has brought us into a new existence. He's given birth to us and to truth in us. Uh, let us pray. I said, by the way, at the start, didn't I, that James is a pretty tough customer. Uh, he's an alpha. Uh, he knows what he's got to say and he says it. We make sure that we get it. And that's, that's what he's like uh, as, as a teacher. So let us pray. So Lord, following on from Pentecost Sunday, we pray for the renewal of the church. We remember that the spirit you've sent is a holy spirit, just as you are a holy God, to bring your holiness, your values, your goodness, your love and joy and your peace into our lives. So Lord, we repent of the many temptations and sins of the church, especially to shallowness, lukewarmness, half-heartedness, the blandness that is so much a part of the life of the church today. Holy Spirit, come and please restore to us our first love. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, Alice and I will see you next time. And until that time, the Lord be with you and be your strength, your shelter and your strong tower.